So now please join me in welcoming Professor Liebricht as he reveals the secrets of snowflakes. Professor? Okay, thank you everyone and welcome. Uh, so, what I want to talk about tonight is snow, okay? Uh, a familiar subject, uh, maybe not so much right now, but, uh, but it's a familiar subject. But I want to take a close look at snow, and we're going to really get in and not look at snow as a pile of uh, crystals, but we're going to look at individual crystals. We're going to zoom right in and look at individual snowflakes, okay? Uh, what are we going to do? Well, here's some. These are, you know, you've seen these two uh, icons of, of winter holidays. These are photographs of real snowflakes. Uh, and uh, things, things like this you see on uh, wrapping paper and all sorts of things. But let's take a close look at one of these. So here's a snowflake, a photograph of a real snowflake. And so what I want you to do tonight is just take a close look at this, and we'll sort of see what we can see. Like you might notice, for example, if you look carefully, that this branch is parallel to that branch, which is parallel to this one and this one. And, and similarly, there's a lot of horizontal branches. So, so there's a lot going on. The crystal forms with these parallel branches. And so that tells you something uh, about uh, why the crystal has that structure. And we'll be looking into that. Okay? Um, and we can look really close. We can start to really get down into the insides of the snowflake and try to see what makes these guys tick. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Let's take your, your standard snowflake. And what I want to look at is why does it have the shape? Why does it look like this? Um, it could be, look, could be any shape. Why this shape? Uh, it has a certain symmetry, as you can see. There's branching and side branching. There are facets on these crystals. Why is all this happening? Uh, well, if you want to ask why the crystal looks like this, you have to ask kind of where it came from, how it was made. And so that's the first step, is to just ask, you know, how are these crystals being formed? Okay, so let's take a look. All right, here's, here's the wrong way to make a snowflake, okay? <laughs> So here we, you know, if, when, we, when people make things, uh, we make uh, things in factories, we manufacture, right? And, and so there are drawings, and there's a factory, and, and there's a, you know, there, you start with raw materials, and you make things. Uh, and when you do it that way, uh, everything looks the same. You know, you make cars, they all look the same. But nature, nothing is made this way in nature. Nature, you know, when you make a tree, you don't get a plan and start with wood. No, you plant a seed, and it sort of turns into a tree. In nature, things grow. And when they grow, they're sort of forming by self-assembly. And this is what um, uh, uh, crystals do, snow crystals do too, they grow. That's one reason they all look different. I mean, they're growing, and so it's sort of a, a somewhat random process, okay? So that's the wrong way to do it. What's the right way to do it? Well, let's start at the beginning again. We'll go back and say, where, where does the snow come from? So here we have uh, snow on the ground, and there, where does it come from? Well, it came from the clouds. So what's happening up in the clouds? Clouds are made of water vapor, and uh, water, mo I'm sorry. Clouds are made of water droplets. Okay, lots of little tiny water droplets floating in the air. And as the cloud gets colder, the droplets start to freeze. They don't all freeze at once. Uh, so there's one. Let's say, look at that one. Say that freezes. What happens to it? Well, it starts to grow. It's, it's accumulating water vapor from around it, and the water vapor lands on the ice, and the ice starts to grow, and it gets bigger. Uh, where does the water vapor come from? It comes from the droplets. The droplets will evaporate, and so they evaporate and they turn into water vapor, and then the water vapor condenses on the snowflake. Okay, and it takes about 100,000 water droplets to make one snowflake. And eventually, they get heavy enough that they fall. So this is how you freeze a cloud. I mean, you start with liquid water in the form of droplets, and you end up with solid ice. Uh, it's, it's really a lot more complicated than you'd think it'd have to be, but that's the way it works, okay? So now let's take a closer look now at what's going on in the crystal. Okay, so there's an ice crystal. We know how the molecules fit together in an ice crystal. A crystal means that the molecules are all stacked up in a nice orderly way. And there's a picture of the ice uh, uh, crystal. And, and if you wait like now, you see it has this uh, six-fold symmetry. Okay, and that's just the way the molecules are hooked up. Why do they hook up that way? Well, now you're getting into chemistry and quantum mechanics, and we're not going to talk about that. This is... <laughs> This is just the way they hook up, okay? Not all molecules hook up this way. There are lots of different crystals. Some of them are square and different uh, uh, patterns, okay? But this is the way it works with ice. And so when this crystal is growing, say you start out with a little round piece of ice, uh, the molecules are all stacked up, and the molecules are hitting. It's growing, and so the molecules are hitting, and the facet surfaces are, are nice and flat, and there's not a lot, of, not to hang on to. There's not a lot of molecular binding there. 
Whereas these, these rough regions, those little nooks and crannies, there's lots of molecular bonds available. And so the water molecules like to go to those, those places where there's a lot of chemical energy. And so they go to the bonds. And so the rough regions soon fill in, if you let it grow. And so as it fills in, it starts to form a faceted crystal. And so uh, as it take, if you start with a round crystal and let it grow for a little while, uh, the fast-growing surfaces grow and the slow-growing surfaces don't. So pretty soon you're left with nothing but slow-growing surfaces. And those are the facet surfaces. Okay, and so this process is how the geometry of the water molecule, because it has some geometry, and that's how it's transferred to the geometry of a large crystal, through this process of faceting, and the sort of selective um, uh, growth of different surfaces. And when we grow little tiny crystals in the lab, we get these little hexagonal prisms, uh, so that's how it works. Uh, and this also tells you why there's no four-sided snowflakes or five or or seven or eight, you know, okay, you may cut those out of paper, but in practice, you know, in, the, in nature, uh, there's only six-sided snowflakes, and it's because of the underlying structure of the crystal, okay? So now what happens, okay, the snowflake gets larger, and it'll start to, it'll undergo this thing called a growth instability. I would call it a branching instability. And what it is, you've got a hexagon over here, and the water molecules have to sort of diffuse through the air to get to it, okay? There's a lot of water out here, not so much near the crystal, because it's kind of sucking all the water out of the air. And so the water molecules are, are drifting in, and the corners stick out a little farther, and so since they stick out a little farther into the humid air, they grow a little faster, okay? So the corners grow a little faster, and then there's this instability. It's a positive feedback. What happens is they, they stick out a little bit, so they grow faster. Well, that makes them stick out even more, so they're growing faster, and they stick out more, and et cetera. And so if you start with a hexagon, pretty soon they, you can sprout branches. And so when this process starts, it takes off pretty fast, okay, because of this positive feedback. And that's a, that's a growth instability, this positive feedback. And then you get a branched crystal, and then with time, you can see it can make side branches also, okay? And this is how the, the snowflakes get most of their structure, through this process of branching and side branching, okay? So, uh, so here's sort of the, the picture as seen from the, from the cloud or from the snowflake. You start, just to summarize, you start with a little water droplet, it freezes, it grows into a hexagon because of faceting. As the hexagon gets bigger, then it starts to form branches, okay? And uh, branches will all form at once because the, when the conditions are right, they all form at once. And the crystal then uh, changes, uh, it's falling through the cloud, so it'll see different humidities and different temperatures as it falls. And each time it sees a different uh, set of conditions, the growth changes. And so for a while, you get branching, and then maybe you get plates growing on the ends of the branches, and then more branching. And so, and so it goes as the crystal falls. And so now the crystal, if you look at it, it had a complex history. Okay? It, it, the temperature and humidity it saw as it fell is just a very complex function. And it, but each arm, each arm saw the same history, because they all traveled together. When they were over here, one temperature, one over here. So they all grow in synchrony. The six branches all grow in synchrony. So it has the symmetry. And no two crystals follow exactly the same path, and therefore uh, they all look different. So you have these crystals that are symmetrical and yet different from all the others. Okay, and it's just because of this, uh, this sort of set of conditions. Okay? So when you look at a snowflake, now here's a, here's a nice example of a nice snowflake. You can see the basic features. Okay, there's a little hexagon right there. That's how it started, with its little faceted hexagon. And then it sprouted branches. And then started maybe side branches, and the side branch, had, there were these side branching events where side branches formed on all six arms at the same time. And so it goes. And so it has this symmetry. It's not perfect. Uh, and so you can also see why the branches are parallel, because the, the um, directions that the, the arms grow in has to do with the underlying uh, crystal symmetry. And this is a single crystal, so the molecules are all lined up in here from one end to the other. It's a complicated shape but inside the molecules are all lined up in the same direction, okay? So it's great, there it is. You can sort of understand, uh, in a nutshell, how snow snowflakes form, okay? But what if you see this on your sleeve? That's something weird. Or this, you might find this on your sleeve one day. Or this, what is that anyway, okay? Well, these are all snow crystals in that each one of these is a single crystal of ice. Just like this one, this is a single crystal of ice, all of these, they're different kinds of snow crystals. Now you don't see these other ones, Christmas time you only see these, these have good press agents. The other ones, no, you know, they're, they're sort of the black sheep of the family. So we want to understand, you know, how, um, how all these things work, why do we get all these different types of crystals? 
Well, one of the fun parts about science is everything's connected, okay? Everything's interconnected. So if you want to figure out how snowflake forms, you start to look at other crystals. So, for example, I started reading about this subject because I just got interested in it. And uh, there are mineral crystals, you know, rocks. Minerals are, are crystals. There's thousands of different minerals. You can get you know, rock hounds, you can go out and find different crystals. Here's just a few examples. And uh, uh, geologists study these things. They like to know what's, what's in the ground. And you can get the crystal structure of all these minerals from crystallography. That gives you where the molecules sit. That's sort of a statics problem. That tells you where the molecules are in the crystal, just like the, the ice, uh, ice crystal uh, diagram I showed you. We know where the molecules sit in these crystals, but they also grow into these funny morphologies, and we don't really know how this works. And you talk to the geologists, and uh, they don't actually know how this goes. Uh, and as you, if people try to model it with fancy computer models and things, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, and that doesn't really work either. Um, so again, when you start researching this and reading about this, you find that people just don't know this. Uh, we dig these minerals out of the ground, and uh, we don't really understand why they look like they do. Um, and that's true for, for most crystals, including ice. Ice is a mineral, and we don't quite understand all these, why they have all these complicated shapes. It's a puzzle. Um, well, what about industrial crystals? Uh, there are a lot of crystals we use, uh, like uh, semiconductors. Okay, every computer and every cell phone begins with a, a block of semiconductor. And so we grow lots of semiconductor crystals. Surely, we understand everything about this. Uh, but so I started reading about this. No, not really. We don't really understand this either. Uh, what the engineers do, the engineers want to make big, perfect crystals, and they develop these recipes for how to do it. Uh, it's just like cooking, you know, you develop a recipe. Even if you don't know exactly what's going on in the, with the recipe, you know, you know how to do it. And so that's kind of what happens, is all these crystals people make, they don't exactly understand how they work, uh, it's just you've developed recipes over the years that, that, that do work, and if you, all you care about is the final product, you know how to make the final product. We obviously know how to make semiconductor crystals, but the fundamental physics of it, the molecular dynamics, is still puzzling. And so, again, we don't really understand how th these morphologies come about, and we can't calculate growth rates and things like that. And so, so it's, you know, it's just a bit of a puzzle. And when I got started in all this, I wasn't thinking about ice exactly. I was really thinking about crystals in general, including important crystals, semiconductor crystals and diamond crystals. Uh, and thinking about, well, how could you make these things better? You know, what else can you, can you do? If you understand the physics better, uh, presumably you can understand how to make better recipes and make better things. Uh, but it's a hard problem because, you know, crystal growth is very di molecular dynamics, involves a lot of molecular dynamics, it's complicated stuff. And so when I was looking about this, I think, well, you know, it's the, the broad problem is really too hard. So we want a simple, you know, you want some, so one, you know, something you can get your hands around. So it's like, well, what you need is a case study. You know, so let's pick one crystal and figure out how that one works, okay? And don't worry about the rest. Don't worry what it's good for. Let's just get one and we'll get that. So which one? It's like, well, there's this. It's like, wait a minute, ice. Ice is the perfect one. Uh, why? Why is ice great? Well, it's a simple system. It's just one molecule, water. Uh, we really know about that water molecule, too. I mean, uh, people have studied water for, for a long time. We all know all about the chemistry and everything. Uh, these things grow from, from vapor, and that's convenient. We understand vapors really well. It obviously has a lot of different shapes. Uh, now, as an experimentalist, I really like these next two. It's inexpensive, and there are no safety issues. <laughs> You know, I've grown other crystals in, as well and trying to understand crystal growth. And every other crystal you can sort of think of growing comes with a lot of safety baggage. Uh, you have to somehow, you buy these things, you have to dispose of them, you have to not ingest them. Uh, well, not water. <laughs> when you're done with the experiment, you pour it down the drain. You can't pour anything down the drain anymore, but you can pour water. So it's a great crystal. Uh, so now we're trying to understand the molecular dynamics of how crystals grow by looking at this one, okay? So there we go, how do we start? Uh, well, let's do a little experiment, okay? Because uh, one thing, nice, nice thing about ice is you can do some experiments with it, it's cheap. So we have a, a tank, and the tank is, uh, you know, maybe half as tall as it is here, about a meter high, and we put some cooling pipes around it so we can chill that tank to whatever temperature we want. It's got air in it, and then we put some heated water inside the tank, and the water, uh, evapor water evaporates and it puts water vapor into the air, and that floats around here and cools, and so now you've got a lot of water vapor and cold air, so the air becomes super saturated. It means the humidity is above 100%, so crystals can grow. And then we have a little nucleator. You've got to get the crystal started. 
And what we do is we take a little pulse of, of compressed gas, and that expands very rapidly, and gets very cold, and that causes crystals to form. So we nucleate a bunch of little crystals, and then they just float around here, and they're very tiny. They float around and grow until they eventually get heavy and they fall. Uh, and we have a microscope down here. So it's a lot like what happens in the clouds, except it's a really tiny little cloud. Okay, and, uh, and so they don't fall very far, they don't get very big. Uh, but we can uh, see what happens when we change the conditions. So let's do that. Here are some crystals made that way. These are grown at minus two Celsius, okay, just below freezing. And what do you see? Here's a 50, so that's a, you know, very small. 50 microns is about the diameter of a human hair. Okay, so these are tiny little crystals because they didn't fall very far. Um, and mostly these are little plate-like crystals, okay, little hexagons. There's a lot of variation because the conditions in the tank are not uh, super constant, but mostly they're little plates, okay? Uh, so let's do the experiment again, but now at a little colder temperature. Here's minus five. So instead of plates, we have columns. So think wooden pencils, you know, they got six sides and they're long and skinny. Well, that's what these are. They're, 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 just, they're long and skinny and they got six sides, okay? Uh, and so you see it's very different uh, just by changing the temperature. And then we can go a little colder, minus 15, okay? And now we get plates again, but big, thin plates. Here's one seen edge on, they're very thin. Uh, so, um, so again, the, the morphology changes just with temperature. Uh, so we can put all that together. We can do the same experiment over and over again uh, with different conditions, and we get what's called the snow crystal morphology diagram, okay? Uh, and what, you, what it is, is there's temperature down below and humidity over here or supersaturation. And so if you grow crystals at very low supersaturation, that means they grow very slowly. And so then you get simple things, simple prisms. Okay? As you grow faster, they, get, they, grow, they, they grow faster, they get more complicated. Okay, that's just that's the way these things usually work. But there's a, and we sort of understand that. Uh, but they also switch. They go from plates to columns, to plates to columns, okay? as a function of temperature. And that's kind of a strange behavior. Uh, this was discovered a long time ago in the 1930s uh, by a physicist, a Japanese physicist, Ukihira Nakaya. He was the first person to do these experiments, and he, this is what he found. And what's really amazing is we still don't know why they do this. Uh, I mean, here it is. Um, uh, you know, we don't even have a good qualitative explanation. It's not like we're missing a few details. It's we don't really know at all. And it's just ice, you know, you'd think we'd know, understand everything about ice, it's, you know, snowflakes, they fall out of the sky. But, uh, but this thing where they change from, with temperature, we don't get that yet. So that's a puzzle, it's a great puzzle. We gotta, you know, we're trying to understand this, okay? Uh, this line, the water saturation line, that's sort of the, the uh, super saturation you might find in a, in a dense cloud. So these are sort of atmospheric conditions, okay? So what do we do, how do we solve this one? Uh, well, one thing we can do is go looking around. First step in any uh, uh, scientific investigations, you've know, got to do some observations. And so I got into snowflake photography. It's a funny thing to do, but I do it. Um, so what I do is start with a microscope. I made my own microscope. Snowflakes are sort of the wrong size. They're a little too small for macro lenses, a little too big for a microscope. So I made something that fits the size of the snowflake. And, uh, and so it sits, I go out and look for snowflakes. Uh, I should point out though, that you don't need a lot of fancy equipment if you want to look at snowflakes. What, what I like to do is I carry one of these around. That's a little hand magnifier, cost a couple dollars. And you can see a lot of neat stuff if you just uh, put that and point that at your snowflake sometime. Okay, so I you know, recommend you might want to go and look at these things. All right, so here's how it works when photographing snowflakes out in the field. So you can't just pick up snow on the ground because uh, when the snowflakes sit on the ground, they sort of deteriorate and they don't look so nice. You got to get them right when they're growing or soon after they've grown. And so what I do is you wait till it snows, and I set out a piece of cardboard. That's that blue cardboard. It's right over here on a tripod. That's a piece of just a piece of blue cardboard. And you let the crystals fall. And this is what I do anyway. And I let the crystals fall. And then I look around. Here's the here's the cardboard you see in the edge here. And I look around for nice crystals. It's like, well, you know, that's a piece of junk, and so that one might be good. <laughs> And so then when I see a good one, I pick it up. I got a little paintbrush, and I just go in there and you kind of pick it up with a paintbrush, and you put it on the microscope slide and stick it under the microscope. So there you go, and voila, nice picture of a snowflake. Repeat, okay. 
Uh, people ask, you know, you're picking these things up, aren't they a little tiny and awfully fragile, and what if you break them? It's like, yeah, I break them, you know. <laughs> you, know just, you just throw it away, you know. <laughs> Nobody has to know. You know, they're, they're falling out of the sky, so you break one, the wind blows them away, you just pick up another one, try it again, so. Uh, uh, what about, do they melt? People ask me something, you know, do they melt? I mean, you're putting them under a microscope. And yes, they do. And if it's cold, then it's like on top here. They don't melt, they evaporate. So this crystal is sitting under the microscope, and I have to have some light on it, so I have to light, put some heat into it. And also my body is, is a little warmer, and so they start to deteriorate. And so about two minutes, you see this one just, I just let it sit on the microscope slide, and I took a picture, and took another picture, and another picture. And after two minutes, there wasn't much left. And so, uh, and that's the norm. I mean, you, you got to be fast, because uh, they do deteriorate, they evaporate. Uh, sometimes, if, if the weather's warmer, this, was, this, was prob this top one is about minus 15, it was outside, here is minus 2. Okay, it's very warm. And so when it's that warm, they, they evaporate a little and then they just melt. And so it turned into a little puddle. Uh, it's really hard, even 27 seconds, too, you really got to rush with these. Uh, it's a lot, a lot easier to take pictures of snowflakes when it's colder. Okay, uh, so if you want one like this, you got to be in the right conditions. Got to be cold. You got to and you got to hurry. You got to jump in there, but you have to do that anyway because because um, you need a lot of pictures to get some good ones, and so you can't can't sort of dilly dally around. You just got to throw them in there one after another uh, because the snow only falls so long. Every snowstorm is a little different. Uh, sometimes you get lousy snow. Sometimes you get great snow, and and the and the crystals change from uh, from one. Oh, about 15 minutes, and can, they can change a lot. Um, I get good at this picking up snowflakes. Here I picked five up and put them all on my microscope slides. So made a little snowflake family portrait. Uh, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, some, you can really find some beautiful ones. I mean, if you go out and look, and, uh, look for these things and spend a lot of time at it, which I do, you know, I like to, it's really fun. I like to take pictures of snowflakes. It's like a treasure hunt. You never quite know what you're going to find because they're so tiny, you don't really see it until you put them under the microscope, and then it's like, whoa, that's a great one. And uh, now, I have to point out, full disclosure, that this is usually what you see. <laughs> if you go out, you know, next time it snows here in Waterloo, and get out your magnifier, 90% chance you'll see this, because this is the normal thing. And what this is, it's just a bunch of little tiny crystals. They're all forming really fast, and they collide, and they stick together. Uh, and you just get a mess, and they all interfere with one another's growth. This is the, the wrong kind of thing. Uh, what you like is a day when it's cold and when the crystals are falling very, or coming down very gently, slowly. Not much snow, not a snowstorm, no wind. Okay, so uh, you know, so you can get some nice crystals. Uh, now, if you got, if you want to find some of these beauties, you know, these big ones, you got to be really in the right place at the right time. Not every old, any old snowfall is going to give you a nice snowflake. There's maybe a few, but not very many. Okay, so you really got to be, like I say, in the right location and at the right time. For example, where I live, hmm, Southern California. <laughs> okay, this is not a good place. So uh, uh, that's where I live, but, you know, it's funny. I'm a, I live in California and I photograph snowflakes, you know, go figure. Uh, so I take my show on the road. That whole microscope fits inside a suitcase. Uh, one of the real challenges is getting that sucker through uh, airport security. So... Uh, so I'll go to places like, here's the uh, Mich uh, Michigan Upper Peninsula. That's not too bad. I've taken some nice pictures there. Of course, you can't have too much of a good thing. And uh, I always say it's, it's hard to appreciate the beauty of a snowflake when you have a shovel in your hands. So. I spent a little time up in, in Alaska. Cold, cold place. That's like going to another planet, one that's far from the sun. This was noon in Alaska. You see how high the sun is. And it was often 40 below. That's too cold. 40 below is too cold. There's not very many snowflakes at 40 below. Uh, up in northern Sweden, got some nice pictures up there. You know, I get invited places. I go these places. Uh, in Japan, there's really beautiful snowflakes in Japan. You know, it's funny. If you live in a cold climate, you take your family down to the beach to, for vacation. What do you do when you live near the beach? You know, I take my family to snowy places. <laughs> it's just a crazy world. But uh, they like the snow. Uh, my, my favorite spot for photographing snowflakes is, is right here in Ontario, in Cochrane. If you don't know where Cochrane is, it's about 700 kilometers north. Uh, just drive, and try, drive until you run out of road, and that's Cochrane. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not a big town, it's a little town, but it's really got just the right conditions. 
And we know this from the morphology diagram because you can sort of see where the best crystals grow. They grow around minus 15, see? So I'm looking for a place that's got, you know, that's, that's, that's the temperature normally. Uh, light snowfalls, heavy snowfalls are bad, light is good. And no wind, wind breaks everything up. So, uh, so this is a great place. Like I say, I've been to Cochrane many times to photograph snowflakes. Uh, and here's some examples, I guess, you know, some pretty pictures. Um, what else? Uh, just, just snowflakes, really very spectacular things. Uh, let's see, you may be asking about the color, you know, these are very colorful pictures. Why do snowflakes, aren't snowflakes supposed to be white? Uh, not really, snowflakes are actually clear. Uh, after all, it's just a sliver of ice, and ice is clear. And so they look white on your sleeve, because same reason sugar looks white. It's got a lot of little pieces. If you take a pane of glass and you bust it up into a lot of little fragments, it's a pile of white powder. Uh, same with ice. When you bust it up into a lot of little pieces, like snowflakes, you get, they look white. Uh, but they're really, really clear, just like glass is clear, and, and salt and sugar are clear. So I have a thing where I have a, a color filter in my microscope. So the snowflake sits here, and I have a color filter, which for you photography buffs, sits at a pupil, and so you don't really see the color filter. And so what I'm doing is I'm shining light through the crystal from behind. And if I just shine light from all angles, I get this first one over here. It's kind of bland. Okay, not a lot of life in that picture. Uh, over there on the upper right, uh, I take some white light from underneath, some red light from one side, and some blue light from the other side, and it gives sort of nice blue and red highlights. Uh, sometimes I'll take light, in, and there's some places where there's no light coming in. That gives more of a, more of a shadowed look. And it gives the crystal some sort of three-dimensional shading, so you can see more detail. Like, look at the, the center of the snowflake. You can hardly see anything up here, but down there, uh, you can see a little more because of the sh just sort of the, the structure, the three-dimensional aspects. And that's from the lighting. Uh, and then sometimes I use, you know, crazy rainbow filters just for fun. Okay. So, uh, so I can, you know, I do try different techniques. You can light them from the back. You can light them from the front. Uh, when you light them from the front, they tend to look white, like snowflakes on your sleeve. Uh, if you look closely, they're not really white. Again, it's got clear places in it because the ice is clear. But all the edges look white. And so, okay. Uh, sometimes I'll take a picture using uh, instant light, so this looks a little more like what you'd see on your sleeve, okay? But I like the colors. I go for the colors, uh, uh, just because it's fun. Uh, that's my contribution to snowflake photography, is, is adding color. Uh, just, you know, it's pretty. You zoom in there and see some things. So this one, here's a nice example of a sort of a crazy rainbow snowflake. Uh, some people think, you know, I must be using polarized light or something, but no, no polarized light, just all this different colors coming in from the side. Uh, and they just come out looking like this. It's kind of kind of neat. Um, sometimes I go a little too far, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and it's fun. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Just just snowflakes, red, Christmassy. You know. Uh, here's one that sort of melted a little on the way down. Sometimes if the clouds are very high, they they form, and then there's nothing between the cloud and you, and so they're coming down. They just kind of evaporate on the way down a little bit, so it looks a little degraded, a little travel-worn, the snowflake. Uh, so let's take a tour. Let's go back to the beginning. You got your microscope, and let's look at everything. You know, what, what do we see? Let's, what, what falls from the sky? So the smallest crystals, little tiny things, are, are little simple plates and columns, and these are, these are around. Um, and when it's very cold, you see these a lot, because they're so tiny, they're very faceted. If you see, sometimes you get a snowstorm that's made up of these things, and people call that diamond dust, because you just see these little sparkles in the air on very cold days. You can see that sometimes. And that's made of little tiny crystals, and they're very simple crystals. Okay? So those are the smallest, you know, a fraction of a millimeter. Um, here's some more. Little, little prisms, a little plate, you know, simple, not too many markings, nothing much to it. These are a fraction of a millimeter. Okay? You need a microscope to really see these well. This one's maybe a little more than a millimeter. Uh, as they get bigger, they get more structure. And the next step are these what are called broad-branched stellar plates. Uh, you know, people like to look at snowflakes, you've got to give them names. So we have names for these things. Uh, these are maybe one or two, three millimeters. And you see they've got some branching, uh, lots of uh, surface markings. Here's a nice one. Uh, you can see the, the symmetry is kind of fun. I mean, look at, like, for instance, these lines. They just form a nice little hexagon all around the crystal, so they're very symmetrical. Uh, sometimes I, you know, here's, I call this one the six pinheads. You can see these guys here, there's their arms, 
and their legs, and there's their little pinheads. And so uh, usually when you see little guys in the snowflakes, it's time to go inside and warm up for a while. Uh, so, uh, so here's another one, just, uh, just a nice little snowflake, you know, not too complicated. Uh, here's another one, uh, very pretty. This was a cold day. This is probably minus 17, and everything looked like this. They were all... Here's what you normally find. You just put a microscope slide out here. There was a lot of broken ones and a lot of sort of malformed ones, but they still had the same basic structure. Little tiny crystals, a couple of millimeters. Uh, here's a much bigger one, probably four millimeters. This one has a lot of uh, beautiful markings on it. Uh, just another little crystal. Um, so you see the guys are back. Uh, so I call this the Hallelujah crystal because they're Hallelujah. Uh, so. <laughs> All right, so uh, there's another one. I don't know, I just think they take that they're fun, you know. Lots of things to see. Uh, one, of the, one of the features of snowflakes is, are these ridges. And these are, if you see these ridges very prominently, they're called sectored plates. Uh, the ridges you can see in the upper right there, the ridges kind of divide the crystal into sectors. There's no real standard na naming convention for snowflakes. I like to say it's like when you name bread or pasta, you know, it's just sort of infinite variety, and you can sort of draw the line somewhere. You got your wheat bread and your pumpernickel, or maybe, you know, the long skinny ones, a baguette, or, you know. It's just how you decide to name these things, and same with snowflakes. There's a spectrum, and, and we give them names. Um, people have been doing this for a long time. Uh, here's another one, a lot of sectors. Um, duck feet, I call them, because you say they look like little duck feet. This is not, you, you see a lot of this, I mean, uh, these sectored plate crews, another, here's another duck feet. Uh, so some of these things you just see over and over again, so uh, I just want to point them out. Um, you know, lots of them. Here, as you can see, the, uh, the broad branch plates in the, in the sectors, uh, you know, just, just lots and lots of, of every, you know, they're all a little different. It's fun when you're photographing because you never quite know what you're going to get. I could say it's a little treasure hunt, and so you just see what you can find. Now here's one. You see a lot of this. Uh, it's called a rhymed crystal. One of those little spots. I told you the crystal's forming up in the clouds, and the clouds are made of water droplets. Sometimes what happens is the crystal will form, and forms very nicely, uh, but then it runs into a part of the cloud where the droplets are very dense. Okay, lots and lots of droplets, and just gets coated with these little droplets. And we call that rime, and so there's a snowflake that formed first in a, in a nice region where there weren't a lot of droplets, and then it just ran into, a, it plowed into a bunch of droplets, and it got kind of kind of covered. Uh, sometimes this, this happens a lot, and here's a, there was a, there's a snowflake in there somewhere, and, uh, and then it just ran into all these droplets, and they just piled on, and you get this very, uh, it's called grapple, okay? Uh, meteorological term. Um, now, they get bigger, they get a little more complicated. You get the stellar dendrites, stellar because they're star-shaped. Dendrite means tree-like. And so here you see brand, the main branches and side branches. Uh, they're still thin plates. Uh, if you look at them from the side, they're, they're really very thin. Uh, and they, when they get a lot of branching, we call them fern-like stellar dendrites because they look like little ferns. Okay, and these are, these are big. Uh, these can be three, four, five millimeters in size. So these are the ones you st are most prominent on your sleeve. Okay, here's a nice example. And uh, here's another one. They're not all perfectly symmetrical. You know, a lot of people think every snowflake's perfectly symmetrical. No, that's not true. Uh, you know, when you photograph snowflakes, nobody wants to look at the ugly ones. They want to look at the nice ones. So, so you know, you get one of these, you throw it away. <laughs> you just kind of say, well, you know, don't mind that. Here's a pretty one. Uh, so here's one. It's got some branching. It's got some plates, a little bit of rhyme on the inside, those little droplets. You know, this is sort of typical. Lots of, they're all a little different. Um, here's a big, beautiful, uh, this is like five millimeters across. This one I found in Sweden. It's a really beautiful example. Um, uh, still, these fern-like stellar dendrites are really common. You can find a lot of these. Uh, that's why people sort of associate these with snowflakes, because they're, they're big and they're easy to see and they're common. This is a picture of my windshield one day after it, you know, just, there was just nothing but stellar dendrites covering it. Uh, if you like to ski and you want really soft, fluffy snow, this is the stuff. Uh, this fern-like stellar dendrites, because the, 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 the barbs sort of don't pack very well, and so this is very, very light and not very dense. And so if you, if you get, a f you know, 10 feet of this and you just jump in, you'll sink up to your waist, okay? So skiers like this stuff, okay? Here's a really big one. This is a centimeter across. That's the biggest one that's ever been photographed, and the biggest one I've ever seen. Saw that one in Cochrane. 
It was very pretty. I mean, these big crystals falling around. I, these fell for 10 minutes, and then they were gone. And I got a few pictures of those. Um, now, columns. I showed you some of these before. We showed you those from the morphology diagram, too. These fall from the sky. You can see the hollow columns, usually. Uh, you see the hollows. That's because the edges grow uh, faster, because the water diffuses to the edges more, and so they get these hollow regions inside. Okay. Um, when they grow bigger, the, the hollows kind of split, and you get split ends, and they become needle, needle clusters. And these can be big, two or three millimeters. Uh, you don't notice them so much. When they fall on your sleeve, it looks like little bits of hair, little tiny pieces of hair. So you don't notice it very much. But if you look at it, you, see, you, know, if you know what's there, you can find it. Uh, some days, you know, the whole snowfall is nothing but needles. Uh, so here again, I just put a microscope slide out, crystals fell on it, and that's what we had. Uh, now here's something weird, capped columns. Uh, so what happens here is if the crystal starts out as a column, say growing around minus five, minus six, and then the conditions change. It moves, say, to a colder region, often because it's being blown up by an updraft. And so you get uh, plates growing on either side of the column. So it's like an axle with two wheels. Here's one I, I photographed. Here's a picture. I just dumped it on the microscope slide. And I took the picture. And then I used my, my little brush and I put it on end, and then I focused on the top plate and then on the bottom plate. And so you see it's two stellar snowflakes on the end of a, on the end of a, um, a column. Okay. Here's another nice one. So, uh, so I have a question for you guys. How many of see, have you seen cap columns? Sorry. How many of you have seen uh, one person? Oh, you guys. You got to get out there and watch. Okay, your assignment is to get a little magnifier. <laughs> Even without a magnifier, you can see these with your naked eye. Um, they're pretty common. Okay. Here's another neat one. It's just a column with very, very thin plates. Seen edge on. Okay. And here's this crazy one I showed you before. And so now, since now we understand how snowflakes work, we can explain this. Okay. What happened here? Well, first there was a needle. So it started growing around minus 5, minus 6, and it grew into a needle. Okay. Slender column. And then it ran into some cloud, and it picked up a bunch of rime particles. And those little droplets froze on the needle and covered it with rime. But then it moved somewhere else where plates grow. And so plates started growing uh, off, off those rime droplets. And the plates are all edge on. And so you see, this is a single crystal of ice. Uh, the molecules are all lined up from one end. Why do I know that? Because the plates are all parallel. Okay, they're not coming out every which way. They're all lined up like sheets of paper. So that's a single crystal. And you can kind of tell the history just by looking at the shape. So uh, there's a completely worthless skill if I ever knew one. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. But you know, after a while, you start to see some, some funny things. Like you might think, well, what about this one? Did you see it? This is a double plate. So think of a, a capped column, but the, the two caps are very close together. So here in the middle, that's the little column. This hexagon, see, that's a little out of focus. That's one of the plates, and then the other plate is behind. Okay. So if you look at it from the edge, it might look something like this. It's a different crystal, but it's, uh, you get the idea. And that's a, sort of a capped column, but their pieces are so close together, we call it a double plate. Okay. And here's another one. Uh, you can see something's out of focus there. So that looks like a normal snowflake, but there's the other one. And now I can go back to the first one. So you see it's two plates, one on top of the other, with, a, with an ax, axle uh, between the two. Okay. Here's another funny thing. This is a split plate. So how does this happen, and what is it? Well, first of all, there's this little round thing. That's the column. Started out as a little column, then two plates formed on top of the column. But the plates are growing right next to one another, and, and they're competing for the water vapor. And so if one of them gets ahead, then it robs all the water vapor from its, from its neighbor, and off it goes, and the neighbor is stunted. And so you see this half, these three branches are on one plate, and these three branches are on the other plate. <laughs> There's the little diagram on the, on the side there, so what you look like. And so it looks like, kind of like an ordinary snowflake, except it's messed up in the middle. Okay? It's got a little rhyme on it, too. Okay? Here's another example of that. So you see here's the column in the middle, and then two plates. There's one half, and there's the other half. Uh, and you can get these in all combinations. You get three and three, or you can get two and four, or one and five. Uh, you know, they're all out there. Okay? You don't really notice it until you sort of get it, start looking closely. Um, 
Triangular snowflakes. You can find triangular. Who knew there were triangular snowflakes? Okay. Uh, you know, they're, they're out there if you look for them. Uh, they're not, you know, perfect triangles, but you see they're funny, kind of funny looking. They're fairly common, you know, if you look for them. Uh, I wrote a little paper on why these grow. It's, uh, it's not too bad, but they're obviously different. Here's another one. So, uh, 12 branched crystals. You can see 12 branched snowflakes too if you go out looking. It's really just like two six-branched snowflakes, one on top of the other. And these are fairly common as well. Uh, here's another one. I think I put in, no, here's another one. Okay. And uh, here's that collection board I showed you before. And you can sort of see, this is kind of a random shot, and there's a nice crystal, and there's a nice one. There's a lot of this, these grapple things. And over here, there's, there's a 12-sided one, you see. So they're out there. That's what they look like. You can sort of spot them. You know, you're pretty good at picking these things out. It's pretty good. Okay. And there's a whole menagerie of things. Um, I mean, uh, you can just start writing down what different kinds. And it's just crazy. There's all sorts of shapes. And uh, um, some have, you know, columns and plates all mixed together. Funny patterns. So this is, I wrote a book, A Field Guide to Snowflakes. And it sort of tells you about this kind of stuff. And it comes, it comes back to me for the physics. You know, you're... I look at all these crystals, and it's fun to look at them, but why are they there? I and mean, why do they have all these crazy shapes? Why so much diversity? Uh, why all the different shapes? What's going on? And, uh, you know, what's the underlying physics? Um, it all really comes back to this morphology diagram. This is sort of the, the key. This is the Rosetta Stone, if you will. And then these other crystals, these crazy things, they all just see different combinations of conditions under. And, and you know, cloud's a crazy place. Uh, it can be warm on one side and cold on the other, and so lots of crazy things happen. But this is the basics. If you, if you understand this, then you can kind of understand uh, the rest of it. We don't understand this, so it's a problem. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time trying to figure this out. You know, it's like, again, you, know, you start with all crystals, and you look at one, and, and there's these puzzles, like, so, I, you know, what does the ice surface really look like? It's not a simple surface. Actually, there's something called surface melting, where the top layers will actually uh, start to get disordered, and called a quasi-liquid layer. Uh, and, you know, when these molecules are attaching to the surface, how quickly do they attach, and how does that work? And the, there's a lot of stuff going on at the molecular scale that I like to try to figure out, and how does that molecular scale physics translate into the shape of the snowflake? And why does it depend on temperature and give these transitions? And they're still trying to figure out all that stuff. And I'm not going to tell you all the details. That's, it's, it's another lecture for another day. Uh, but I spent a lot of time doing experiments, um, you know, a little more complicated than before. So I'm uh, uh, just, uh, uh, here's that tank I had before, and the crystals are growing. And now I put a little, separate little tank inside, a little, little chamber, and it draws some of those crystals in there. And I, I let them fall onto a substrate, a little, little glass disc, and they sit on there, and I position one crystal underneath the microscope. So I'm really trying to make this setup, where I've got a little chamber with uh, some frost on the top. It's an ice reservoir, and a little test crystal. And then I, I make careful measurements of, of, uh, of how that crystal grows. And I can change the temperature, because it's all controlled. I can change the temperature, and I can change the temperature difference, and so I can change how fast it grows. And, uh, you know, trying to use all this information to kind of figure out what's going on at the molecular level. And that and modeling, you know, it's physics. We, we understand some of this stuff, just not all of it. So, uh, so we keep going. Uh, here's what it looks like in the lab. Uh, you know, they're not just falling out of the sky anymore, so you've got to make them. And uh, so here's the big tank, about a meter high. And then the, the real experiment is down in, in this little thing. And there's lots of plumbing and, and cameras and a, a chiller and computer attached. And, so I'm doing this, you know, I tend to make lots of little tiny snowflakes like this one. Uh, these are easier to, to do the physics on. They're little tiny things. They're maybe half the diameter of a human hair. And so I make these, and then, uh, uh, and then we measure the growth rates and try to do all this. And so. so it's always fun when I'm doing a run. I tell my wife, I say, you know, got to go to work, dear. These snowflakes aren't going to grow themselves, you know. So... <laughs> so uh, Anyway, so I got a, a website uh, if you want to go there. But I'm going to end, I think I'm going to end, yeah, snowcrystals.com. I'm going to end with some movies. Because one of the things we do, or I do, in, in addition to uh, uh, just making uh, little snowflakes and, and trying to understand the physics, sometimes they like to make big snowflakes. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story, because we were doing this stuff, I was doing this stuff in you know, this, uh, this, this hardware, and I get a call from the BBC. 
And the BBC goes, we're making a documentary called Frozen Planet, and they, they wanted movies of growing snowflakes. And I said, you know, nobody's ever made a good movie of a growing snowflake because people made kind of lousy, low-resolution movies, but nothing very good. And they said, oh, no, we want, we, this has got to go on HDTV, you know, we want all new, nice movies. And I said, well, you know, I think I know how to do it because I've been working with this stuff and I had some ideas. And so, you know, for a small fee, you know, we, can, <laughs> we can try. <laughs> and, you know, they said yes. And so, uh, so I got into the snowflake movie business, believe it or not. So uh, let me show you here some movies. What do we got? Okay, let's see if I can get this to go. There we go. So we start with a little plate, a little tiny, well, I didn't stop it quite soon enough, but we start with a little, uh, a little prism that sits on, the, on, the, uh, on a glass substrate. And then, and then we sort of make it, I make it grow. I, I put, I actually uh, just blow a little humid air at the thing. And, uh, and it grows. It doesn't actually grow on the glass, it grows above the glass. So it's like a, uh, half of a capped column. There's a little column there, and then this thing sits uh, above the glass. Okay. Now I have to put this on here. You know, it's a real snowflake. I've, give, I've shown this before, and people say that was a great computer simulation you showed. Like, no, it's not a computer. You know, we don't even know how to do the computer simulations. That we're trying, but we know how to grow them. This is, it's easier to grow them than it is to make them on the computer. So, so there's that. Let's show you another one here. So let's see, we got another one. Yeah, another one. This one's good. All right, little tiny speck of a crystal. And now it grows. And uh, you see these transitions, you know, these little ribs, and then all of a sudden, oop, now it starts to uh, uh, form branches. And then, well, it'll make plates again. What you don't see, these things don't happen spontaneously. What you don't see is I'm sitting over here at the controls going, yeah, ha, let's make some. <laughs> I want some plates. No, I want some, some, uh, some branches. No plates, no branches. And so you can just sit there. It takes about 45 minutes. And so I watch this, and, I, and I'll sort of go, oh, plates for a while. Yeah, plates. I want plates. And let's put a line on the plates now. And it's like, okay, enough plates. Now let's grow some branches. And I turn the knob, and okay, that's enough of the branches. Now let's make some plates on it, some little ribs on the plates. Now more branches. You get the idea. You know, you just uh, sort of like being a puppet master. You just, uh, so, this time I started with two seed crystals sitting next to one another. And now you see they, they interfere with one another. You know, these crystals are not pre-programmed to grow into nice symmetrical shapes. If they, if they get interfered with, then, you know, the, the water vapor, they're competing for water vapor. And in the middle, there's just not enough water vapor for both of them. And so, you get a, a region where there's just not a lot of growth. The growth is stunted. Uh, so, so, they interact. And this, of course, happens in the atmosphere all the time as well. So they're not perfectly symmetrical, only if you get a nice isolated one. So here's one where I really went for the plates, you know, beautiful sectored plate there. And then uh, uh, more some ribs, now some branches. Um, I, I feel I'm getting kind of good at this. I can, think I, can, I can make them better than I can find them outside, or at least I'm getting there. So uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe the next generation. But uh, that's very pretty, you know, you get these nice snowflakes. So. So well, that's that. I think it's one of my favorites because it just it ends up so nice. So a little tiny speck again, uh, and now the thing grows out. And I don't know, there's, there's no exact formula for it yet. Uh, and I'm not controlling it by computer. I'm just sitting there with the knobs and kind of watching it. Uh, You've you got an hour to watch this grow, so it takes a while. But as you can see, you can get some pretty, pretty nice looking snowflakes this way. So. Uh, so I'm kind of trying to perfect this, and we'll get really majestic-looking snowflakes, but maybe, uh, maybe later. So, All right, and we'll stop with that. So thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we will open the floor to questions. And why don't we start right here? I was just wondering, is there a difference in the way that frost forms as opposed to snowflakes? Okay, frost, yeah. Uh, when frost forms, it's basically the same idea. You've got um, uh, water vapor in the air and it condenses onto something. If there's an ice particle in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, these, these things, you have little droplets freeze and that's what it condenses onto. But on the ground, you've got you know, grass and the, the water vapor will condense on the grass. 
And if you get out your magnifier and look at the grass, you'll see the same kinds of crystals on the grass, the so frost crystals also. So it's, a, it's the same basic uh, process, yeah. Let's go right here to my right. What, kind, what do the crystals look like that come out of snow guns and, on ski hills? Ah, you know, I, 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 I didn't put that slide in. I should have, but um, it's a very different process. What happens is with a snow gun is uh, uh, you start with a nozzle that shoots out a little water droplets. So it's an atomizer, you know, shoots out little water droplets. And that's mixed in with compressed air. And the compressed air expands and it gets cold. And so that freezes the droplets and sort of freezes them as they're expanding. And then there's a big fan that blows it out into the slopes. And so, if you, and so it's a different process. You've got these droplets and it gets really cold. It's so cold they just all freeze. And uh, to make a snowflake takes half an hour. Uh, these, these things, you know, they, they, they're very much, much faster. Uh, so you basically just freeze the droplets and then blow them up. So if you take a picture of this, and I've done this, what you see is just a bunch of little blobs of ice, you know, little round frozen droplets, about what you'd expect if you, you know, froze this stuff in your freezer. Uh, so it's a di very different process. Let's uh, go to the Twitter feed. Question uh, from Ed Dote. What do we know about the effect of the presence of different gases in the atmosphere on crystal formation? Oh, that's good. You know, there's a whole, you know, that's a whole side of this, the subject I like to think about is, is what happens. Uh, and we work, we work on this in the lab. I like to put in different chemical impurities into the air and see how that changes the crystal growth because it's really a chemical catalysis problem. You know, the catalysts will change how uh, um, chemical reactions uh, form or what the rates of chemical reactions. And similarly, uh, chemicals can change the rate of crystal growth. And uh, strange things happen, like you, you don't get any thin plates if you have a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, impurities in the atmosphere. So if the, if the atmosphere is polluted enough, you would not get beautiful uh, snow crystals because those are the first to go. Uh, there's, but it's, of course, the, the chemistry is a big business. There's a lot of things going on. And that, that's at pretty high, uh, high concentrations. And so if you look at the winter uh, air, it's pretty clean. And so, uh, so there's not a lot of effect of what's up there because there isn't that much up there. Let's go to question on my left. Did you ever grow columns, Snowflake? Do I grow columns? Oh, yeah, all the time. I like to grow columns, too. Uh, you know, they're not so much fun to show audiences. So. <laughs> and I believe another question here on the right. Why, why does the snowflake grow if you blow on it? Ah, well, you know, this thing's sitting on a piece of glass, and... Um, uh, and there's not much going on because it's right next to glass. And so you've got to get some humid air into the snowflake. You've got to get some water vapor. So what I do is I take some slightly humid air and I just have a little you know, funnel and I blow the humid air onto the snowflake. And, uh, and that's where the, the, the high humidity makes the thing grow. So. And a question to the left, my left. Yes. Um I noticed something uh, really un unusual with the uh, snowstorm of 78 we had where it really wasn't snowing down, it was snowing horizontally. <laughs> it was coming off the lake, blowing off the lake. But what I really found strange is one day I was out in the field and I seen real fine snow on a really cold day lifting off the field and rising up. Have you ever seen that? No, I haven't seen that, but, but I've learned in meteorology, you never say never, because there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of these events, like you know, snow rising up from lakes. You know, it might be very rare, uh, but the conditions can be just right uh, to see some, some, some crazy stuff sometimes. So I've never seen that, but that doesn't mean, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of weird stuff out there. Let's go back to the Twitter feed for one. And Professor, this is what we were talking about on the way over. So it's awesome science and photos, but what are the practical applications of studying <laughs> crystal formations of snowflakes? <laughs> well, you know, I got started from this, from looking at crystal growth in general. And, you know, and I, eventually I'll get back to that. But, you know, at some point in the, in the process, you can't think about the applications. You just have to focus on solving this one problem. But, but, you know, one of my answers to this question is that I've written a bunch of books on snowflakes, and, and you know, those snowflakes put my kids through college, so that's a... <laughs> can't get any more applied than that. <laughs> Let's take two more questions. One here, and then we'll follow up on the left. 
does uh, dust particles in the air have any effect on the production of snowflakes? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when, when, when you're forming ice, it's always a, a nucleation problem. That the ice has to nucleate on something. And if you have very, very pure water droplets, for example, in a cloud, uh, those pure water droplets are no dust. If there was pure water droplets, they would not freeze until the temperature got down to about minus 40. Okay, but, but in real clouds, the droplets start freezing at much uh, higher temperatures, around minus 10. And the reason is that inside of each droplet is a little piece of dust because when the cloud was forming in the first place, you just had humid air, and you cool the humid air down, the, the water precipitates out, basically that's like dew comes down, dew will deposit on the grass, but in the clouds, dew, the dew deposits on something, it deposits on the dust, and so every little droplet's got a piece of dust in it. And that dust affects how, uh, how quickly it turns to ice. So. Okay, when I said two, I meant two more now. One here, and then we'll finish <laughs> in the front. I sort of vaguely remember reading or hearing somewhere that if you look at really complex snowflake structures, like some of your fern-like ones, that they have a bit of a fractal structure to them. Is that true? Uh, yeah, it can be uh, a fractal structure. They, you know, fractal mostly means self-similar, and if you grow the crystals big enough, you know, you'll find the branches have side branches that look like the main branches, and the side branches have their own side branches. Uh, that's only when they get really big. Uh, and so most of the time, these crystals, uh, there's not a lot of fractal behavior, so it's not a, it's not a, a sort of a good paradigm to, to sort of use to think about the problem. But it's there. And our last question right here in the front. Have you noticed any difference in the formation of snowflakes with the global warming that we're moving into? Well, you know, if you go back in history, a lot of the, uh, some of the best snowflakes, the early snowflake photographs were taken in, the, in Vermont, and there's a lot of snowflakes in the lower 48, but it's gotten warmer. <laughs> and so uh, you gotta go further north to get the nice snowflakes now. So yeah, if the climate is getting warmer, then it will be harder to find these, these nice snowflakes. So, uh, so I gotta go out there and, and photograph them now before they disappear. So, but yeah, it's really a temperature thing. I mean, uh, the, these big, beautiful stellar crystals form around minus 15, and that's the only temperature they form at. So as, as the, if the winters get warmer, then there'll be fewer big, beautiful stellar crystals uh, in the lower uh, latitudes, so. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Professor Kenneth Liebrecht. Thank you.